All right, we're going to get started, and we're doing this all day. I'm here all day, and uh, talking to scientists. I'm, my name's Regina Barber. I'm, I'm usually at NPR, but today I'm at AAAS, and I'm here with Kathleen Springer and Jeff Bugatti, and they are both geologists, and they're going to tell us something about the peopling of the Americas, which I'm, like, super excited about. It is pretty cool. So, yeah. so what does that mean, just for, because I've been actually researching you all. I, I do my job for real, and... <laughs> What does that mean, though? What does peopling of the Americas mean? I mean, it's just a general kind of catch-all term for when human beings came into North America and then eventually into South America. So there's sort of a conventional wisdom about the timing of all that. And when, Jeff, yeah. what, what, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. It's okay. Yeah. I'm trying to save your voice. It's okay. <laughs> and Jeff, what is the like prevailing theories? Like, what is like? I know that there's a debate, and and so like, yeah. what what are the theories that we're sitting on right now? Of yeah, exactly. When that happened. So, so for most of the, the last century, um, people archaeologists thought that Clovis people were the first to arrive in the Americas about 13,000 years ago, and over the past few decades, there have been some older sites that have come out that. Uh, maybe push th that, that timing back to 15 or maybe 16,000 years ago. So that that's was kind a big of the, deal. It is, and that's the kind of the, the state of the, 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 the knowledge of, of North American prehistory prior to our studies at White Sands. So tell, t paint the picture of White Sands. Like, what does it look like? What did you find? Well, I mean, sort of the, the, the big thing about White Sands is that there is this unbelievable number of Pleistocene megafauna trackways. Where exactly is White Sands? Oh, White Sands is in southern New Mexico. Okay. So White Sands National Park is, um, White Sands is the largest gypsum sand dune field in the entire world, and it's wow. just a beautiful place. And, um, and it just so happens that on the, the, the former lake bed that, um, you know, made these sand dunes ultimately, there are, there's tons of evidence of mammoths and and camels and dire wolves and saber-toothed cats and all kinds of dire ice age thing that are actually yeah, real yeah so they're ice age um, mammals but they are contemporaneous with human footprints that are also all over and and so you know there's a lot that is already known about these you know the animals and the humans and it was really obvious that they're contemporaneous and the part about Jeff and my involvement is that we were asked to be part of this really large international and multi-disciplinary um, team to basically help them figure out the context of all of these prints and to basically get a handle on how old they are. That really was the burning question. So that's what you know we're here today for, to talk about the studies that we did and what the results were yeah. that Jeff would love to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> Before we get to the results, though, um, let's actually like look at the slide right here. Why yeah. are they so nice? Like, why are they so well preserved? The, because they look like that. No. Yeah. I mean, they, they're, yeah. they're on actual. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, the, these are human footprints that are imprinted on a surface. Right. So sometimes they look unbelievably gorgeous like that because that's more of a sand there's maybe a little bit of silt in there why has it um, not eroded though no because they have been revealed by this sort of never-ending wind oh. that sort of scours this basin so the same processes that reveal these tracks at white sands also destroys them okay. so like they hang out for a while and they might be gone in a couple years or even one season so the, you so. need to get these like now Right, so the White Sands resource personnel, that is, what, that is the, their number one goal, to document these things with all kinds of you know, GIS-based technology, LIDAR, and the, the USGS drones have been out there flying this whole area. And you know, they're really trying to quantify the rates of erosion so that they can manage and protect these. They're basically unbelievable and, and, and unique worldwide, these resources. And you can see, I mean, the, the, these are beautiful, right? So yeah. when you're walking around on the landscape, you leave, a, you leave a footprint. The only way that it gets preserved is if it gets buried pretty quickly. Yeah. Oh. And also very quietly. You know, wind, you know, de depositing sand on top of it or something like that so it doesn't, doesn't destroy the footprints. Then they're, they're, they're buried, and they're buried for thousands and thousands of years. They stay that way. Then, as Kat said, the, the deflation, the, the wind kind of scours these sediments away, 
revealing the tracks, and they stick around for a couple a couple years, and then they're gone again. Mm. So that's kind of the lifetime you of the process. You have to be pretty like on top of it. You, you're seeing it, and then you have to like study it as soon as possible. Right, and yeah. they and they have multiple years of data now showing right. how these lake sediments and lake edge sediments are being eroded away. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. once you, once you study these 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 prints. What do you actually, what data do you get from them? I know you're taking like core samples yeah. and you can get like climate of yeah. what was happening in them. You can get age. What are, yes. what are you finding out? Yeah, exactly. So, so there's a, several things. First of all, the, the Palu ichnologists are the people that are the trackway experts, right? And so they're the ones that are, that, are, that are exposing these surfaces and they're measuring every last bit of every footprint. So they excavate the footprints, they measure the width, mm. the, 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 the length, all of the different parameters and stuff. And that's all done at the surface, right? But our, we came into this, and the, the main goal of, of our part of the research was how old are they? Yeah. And if they're at the, if they're present at the surface, you can't date them because you have to be able to bracket these surfaces with the tracks above and below with with datable material. Right. So we had to eventually dig a trench in an area, and then like around it. Yeah, and exactly, and then we okay. trace these surfaces with the footprints into the trench. Then we find, you know, datable materials above and below each one of these right. what we call trackway horizons, and that's that's. And then there's not just one trackway right. horizon. There's multiple trackway horizons when you actually can look at this stuff in cross section. Wow. So, yeah. so you're so you're. T I mean, is core sample the correct term? Like you take no, a, like. Well, we, we dug a trench. You, just so we, trench. you know, we basically told the National Park Service, you're going to have to dig a big trench so that we can get at. You know what really is in the subsurface here. So, so you're a looking trench. at the wall of the trench. Yeah, we're Got Jeff it. and I are in the to right. It. Exactly. So you're looking at a cross section okay. of of all these really finely laminated layers. Okay. And so we're documenting all that. We're collecting the samples for dating in this you know sort of third dimension, if you will. Yeah. The archaeologists and the paleoecnologists, even though we're on the surface there, we're we're looking. They're looking. We're starting the trench. Yeah. We, that is this, that, that is a little trench actually. Yeah. I'm educated. Um, yeah, so they're at the surface um, excavating all these gorgeous footprints, and we trace them into the wall of the trench so that we could lock them into kind of space and time. And then the idea is we need to find something to date. Yeah, so what did you find? Yeah, so a couple things. Uh, in, two th in 2020, when we first did the work, we found layers of seeds, aquatic seeds, um, mm. from like a ditch grass kind of plant. And these layers were positioned above and below several of the trackways, and we were able to date the seeds, right? And the, the ages, spoiler alert, uh, right to the- That's okay, the, no, the, spoil the it, let's do it. Uh, the ages came back between 23 and 21,000 years old. Oh my gosh, okay, so let's yeah. just yeah. back up for a second. Yeah. Yeah. So the prevailing theories were like 13,000, just not that far along, right. far, like yeah. recently. Then they're like, maybe it's 15 or 16, and now you're saying 20 yeah. to 23,000. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a paradigm shifting result. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, and so those results came out in 2021, and you know people really liked it, but it was, Aquatic materials can be problematic for radiocarbon dating. So we okay. use radiocarbon dating for, for, for all of the chronology. And the reason is aquatic materials, basically, if, if groundwater is involved, groundwater moves through old rocks. Some of the rocks have car carbon in them. Oh. Some of the old carbon gets in the, in the water, then into the aquatic plants. So they can give ages that are too old, potentially. Right? Okay. And we knew this going on. And there's a, a number of lines of different evidence that, that we show that this didn't happen. But we knew even way back then that we were going to have to go back and date other types of materials and right. use other techniques because we knew that what we were putting out there was a pretty, pretty big. These are thing. different kinds of people, even. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So we went back in uh, 2022, and we collected samples from the exact same levels as okay. the seed ages, and we collected them for pollen. And so pollen comes from terrestrial plants, and we, right. we targeted pine pollen, basically conifers, which grow on land, so you don't have any of these these groundwater, old water uh, effects. And we, it's really difficult to isolate pollen right. from <laughs> sediment, but it took about a year. Okay. We analyzed 75,000 grains of pollen per sample, so it was a ton of work. Um, and and what was the result? Came back exactly the same wow. as the seed ages. Right. So it yeah. basically showed that. You know, the, the first set of, of, of data was pretty controversial. Yeah. And we... Even though we were confident we were in confident, our ages. Exactly. Yeah. That's good. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but the, but the archaeological community <laughs> wanted more, and we knew that. We knew that, yeah. that we were going to do that. Um, and then we also used a technique called luminescence dating, which is completely different. Luminescence is basically a buildup of energy that's trapped in quartz grains. 
Right. So it dates I've the heard last, about this. yeah, the last time that these quartz grains were exposed to sunlight. So they blow around and then they get deposited yeah. and then the clock starts and those ages came out exactly the same as the others. So what does this mean? So like as you putting this out <laughs> and why are people so resistant? I know it's because it's a new idea, but like what how different are the people then uh, that came over to the Americas from 16,000 years ago versus 23? Like, what does it mean? I mean, they're, they're homo sapiens like us. All of the, all of the computational ethnology that was done, all the statistics indicates they're people like us. Right. So they're people like us. And they just came over much earlier than the conventional wisdom. Um, some people, a lot of people are unbelievably convinced that, that this is you know, sort of a vanguard approach, and we did this. Nobody's ever really looked at footprints. Nobody thought to look on the edges of these pluvial lakes. There's hundreds of Ice Age lakes that are now dry all over the American Southwest. It's a new technique. So it is a new way of looking at it, and and, and, and old school, you know, says, oh, you don't have artifacts. <laughs> like, so? You have a footprint. Yeah imprinted yeah. on a surface that is yeah. a snapshot in time it's a snapshot in time so because it isn't a physical thing people are resistant well they're, yeah. they're used to something yeah. right archaeologists yeah. are used to dealing with artifacts they're used to dealing with yeah. you know, cuts on bones and things like that yeah um and we are we actually have the evidence of the people themselves right. directly so it's we direct can interact in it's with the environment way, it's a different right. way of thinking right it's a different way of thinking it's a different line of of, of data that has not been really yeah. uh, exploited that that much before yeah. And, and what, I, what I mean by people, I mean, like, I think there's theories of, like, how they came over and where they came from. Does that change yeah. the story? So the, our story doesn't really address directly the migration routes, but we have a USGS colleague who is doing this kind of work in Summer Pretorius, and she's looking at ocean currents and sea ice extent during these windows of time during the Pleistocene. Mm -hmm. And Summer's work is showing that there are windows that match exactly uh, what we're talking about, that potentially people could have come down the coastal route um, and made their way. And coastal route being? Uh, the coast, the like, west coast of the United States. Like boats and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, or walked, or oh, whatever. Walked. Okay. Or whatever, yeah. Because yeah. at this time, so this is a time, we call it the last glacial maximum, right? Okay. It's the last time the ice ages and the continental ice sheets were at their maximum extent, and they basically blocked passage from Asia. So people, the, the, the early peoples of, of the Americas came in from Asia through Siberia, down through Alaska, and, and, and then into the what is now the continental U.S. During the, the last glacial maximum, ice sheets thousands of feet thick would have blocked that passage. I see. Okay. So, so for a long time, people like uh, archaeologists were like, well, people couldn't have come here because they were <coughs> had to come here after the ice sheets. But maybe they came before. Exactly. And that's, oh. that's, where, that's where we're getting at. That's where the big shift is, right? So if, if, they were, if they couldn't get here during the last glacial maximum, and we have people in New Mexico during the last glacial maximum, then that they, means they came before. before that, exactly. That's that's fascinating. And, and let's. And this is my last question, and it kind of goes with the theme with the conference. You know, the towards no no worries. Drink your water. Sorry, it'll be okay. Um, towards science without walls. You're talking about all these different scientists. You're talking about how your work is different from what people are used to because it's not a physical artifact. Mm -hmm. Like, can you just kind of like have a? What is your thoughts about like all the different disciplines you've worked with in this program, in I mean, this project? I mean, I'll try, and then Jeff can <laughs> jump in. Um, so there's, go ahead. <laughs> so, so this team is this team is really amazing, and it and it consists of ichnologists, or the you know the footprint experts, and we have a geophysical archaeologist who uses ground penetrating radar to see footprints in the subsurface. Wow. Okay. We have, like we the have, ones that will be right, exactly. um, and we exposed have later. Additional yeah. archaeologists. We have stratigraphy and, and, and paleoclimate. We have geochronology. We also have uh, indigenous archaeologists. And we, we, the Park Service consults with 32 tribes and pueblos uh, <coughs> that call this the area that is now White Sands uh, their, as part of their homeland. Right. So it's a it's a. Because really, you want to do right by the land. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, and it's, an, it's an enormous a number of people, but it's also... Uh, every single person is, is integral because we couldn't do it. If any one person was missing, we wouldn't be able to complete the studies as, as we have. So, it's and it builds your case way. too, right? So that people believe you. It, it does. It does. <laughs> and then you know we we always it's it's really interesting to to have the um, to the, the indigenous folks come out and 
you know, they work right alongside, and you know, they're they're excavating and whatnot, and to see this, the science converging on their oral histories, right. you know, as is, you know, they, they've always been here. Well, that's kind of what we're seeing. In they the have world. words in their language for the megafauna. Right. Wow. Which is super cool, that's right? It's passed and down. By megafauna, you mean like... The mammoths and the things mammoths, like that, yeah. The mammoths, the dire wolves. Giant ground sloths and stuff that yeah. aren't around anymore. I mean, that's pretty convincing to me, yeah. but... <laughs> like, yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. I've learned so much from this. Did you have any other slides? Am I missing? No, it was oh, just that was it. Guys. Yeah. Thank yeah. you so much, Jeff and Kathleen. Thank, yeah. This is amazing. I hope you find more stuff and you use this technique somewhere else. <laughs> that's yep, that's the plan. plan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks.